Welcome to the podcast of Life Change Church, where we exist to love people to life change. We hope that this podcast is both challenging and encouraging to you. Enjoy the message. We are starting a new series today called Better Together, and I heard plenty of laughs during that video. There was a lot of things on there that we can recognize, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, But before we get into the message, I do want to go through some important announcements. Baptism and dedication is next Sunday. And so if you have not been baptized, you would like to be, email Pastor Corbin at corbin.huffman at gmail.com sometime during the week. If you have a child that you have not dedicated to the Lord yet, we do not practice infant baptism. Instead, we dedicate our children to the Lord, and by doing so, are promising that we are going to raise them in the ways of the Lord. So if you would like to do that, email Pastor Corbin. And then next Sunday, Life Change is turning three years old. Woohoo! Yeah, that's exciting. It's exciting. So invite a friend to the 9 a.m. or 10.30 a.m. service next week. We're going to have a big celebration. Be here for that. Student life, you are not meeting tonight. You will meet next week at 5 p.m. And then finally, the next church partnership class is what that's what we do. We don't have membership. We have partnership. The next class will be September 17th at 6 p.m. So be here for that if you have not gone to partnership class. So as I said, we're starting a new series uh, about being better together. And I couldn't help but think of this story when I was preparing for the message in case you're wondering where Pastor Corbin and Sarah are, they are in Kentucky visiting family. Um, and so you get me today, and, and Kelly and I and some of our kids were in the Dollar Tree over in Heath um, last week. And while we're standing in line, here's these three boys filing in behind us. They were all like, like 9, 10, 11 years old, and you could tell that they were really good buddies. They were clowning around, kind of smacking each other around a little bit, kind of arguing with each other with smiles on their faces like boys do. And they just had like a cache of candy. I mean, just a ton of candy in their hands, all three of these guys. But only one kid had the money. And so we're like, kind of, what's going on? We get in this conversation with them. And we start talking to them. And the one kid's like, hey, I'm buying all the candy for all my friends because I'm the only one that has the money and la, la, la. And the other kid's like, my birthday tomorrow or the next day. So we're getting more candy. And it's all about candy and camaraderie with these three kids. And so we start talking to him a little more, and this phrase will never leave me, and I'm going to tell you why it won't leave me in just a moment. The one kid kind of looked up at me, and to be honest with you, he kind of looked like Squint, right? He really looked, looked, if you know who's, right, from, um, oh my gosh, I totally lost the movie, blank. Sandlot, thank you. Kelly calls me that all the time, I should remember, or maybe that's why I block it out. (laughs) But he kind of looked like that kid. And he said these words to me. Yeah, the three of us, we're the triangle of awesome. The triangle of awesome. And the reason that I'll never forget those words is because I have my own triangle of awesome. I like to think of myself as the tip at the top, but the other two guys probably think that they're the top. So I got these two guys in my life that have been best friends since we were young boys. One of them married my sister. Um, One of them did not, but we're still very close. (laughs) Hey, I still have two other sisters. It could have happened. Let me clarify that statement. We're not a polygamous family. (laughs) And so, but the three of us have been best friends our whole lives. In fact, even the ones that are not related, the kids call each other aunt and uncle. I mean, a thousand stories. And so every once in a while, I see something like that, and I'm reminded of the value of my friendship that I have with these two guys and the richness of that relationship. And so right away, I send them a text. I'm like, hey, guys, man, every once in a while, I just run into something that reminds me of the value. I mean, we've been running together since we were young teens. We're all in our 40s, so 30 years of craziness. I was like, hey, I ran into these three kids, and the one kid said, dude, we're the triangle of awesome. And so, of course, I told them about our own triangle, And my buddy responded by, like, that's the name of my fantasy football team this year. Done. The Triangle of Awesome. (laughs) Right? And so the whole point of that story is this. My life and, and their lives, my friends Mike and Jim, the three of our lives are better together. They're better together. 
and we, and we know it. Now, does that mean there hasn't been some ugly moments? No, it doesn't mean that because we're all pretty A personality, and when we fight, we fight. <laughs> but our lives are better together. They're enriched because of each other. Their kids call me uncle because our lives are better together. My kids call them uncle because our lives are better together. And so as we go through this morning's message, and even next um, when Pastor Corbin is up and he's talking about the vision and the mission and the purpose of Life Change Church as we celebrate being free, think about people in your life that you know without a shadow of a doubt your life is better because that person is in it. Right? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a child. Maybe in my, like in my case, it's a friend. Maybe, maybe it's your teacher, Mr. Nilo. Where, right? Maybe it's because of a teacher. Right? There he is. <laughs> right? Maybe it's because a teacher is making a difference in your life. And because of that person, you know without a shadow of a doubt that your life is better together. And this morning what we're going to talk about is discipleship. That discipleship is better together. That as believers in Jesus Christ, it is better when we go through the discipleship process together. And really, all discipleship is is a fancy church word that simply means growing in your relationship with Jesus. That's it. It's growing in your relationship with Jesus. And at Life Change Church, we believe that discipleship is better together. And so here's a question. How do you know if you're growing in your relationship with Jesus? What does that even look like? What does it even mean to grow in our relationship with Jesus? I'm talking about growing in my relationship with Kelly, or I'm talking about growing in my relationship with kids, that's tangible, right? Because they're real people that I have a real physical relationship that I can gauge that relationship. And yes, we know that Jesus is with us always right? His presence never leaves us, but there's not that physical metric that you can see and have that touch with. And so what do we gauge that discipleship process with? What, how do we measure that growth? Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and use version. It is a fantastic app. Um, it allows you to always have your Bible with you. Take it anywhere, anytime. There are also great reading plans on YouVersion that will help you in your discipleship process. And in an effort to provide discipleship being better together, our Facebook page now will feature a weekly reading plan that we can do together as a church that just started. So go to our Facebook page and you'll find the weekly reading plan and it's already um, seeing a lot of success. And so if you don't have YouVersion, go ahead and download that format this morning is going to be just a little bit different, um, but we're going to get into it right away. So if you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 8. We're going to be in verse 30 and 31. And what we're going to talk about this morning is 10 identifiers of being a disciple. So what is it that measures a disciple? How does it look if you're growing in your relationship with the Lord? I believe that John chapter 8 carries 10 identifiers, and we're going to go through all through Excuse me, we're going to go through all 10 of those this morning. And so the first step or the first identifier in being a disciple is somebody who believes. It's somebody who believes. And you can see very clearly that John chapter 8, and let me go ahead and have that next one, please. John chapter 8 and verse 30, he says, As he spake these things, many came to believe in him. And so Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed him, they believed in Jesus, right? Everyone believes in something, right? We are, sometimes you run into people that say, well, you know, I don't believe in a God, or I don't believe in this, or I don't believe in anything. Like, I don't believe in people because they always fail you, or I don't believe in the government because they're just... Listen, even in the declaration of not believing in something, you're, you're still placing a belief somewhere, even if it's a disbelief, right? We're created to believe, right? For those of you who have maybe not come to the Lord until you were an adult, you still believed in something. And then you had this moment where you met Jesus. And there's like, wait a minute, that right there, that's the it that I've been looking for my entire life. And there's this belief that takes place. 
You have to believe in Jesus in order to be a disciple of Jesus. And I want to let you know that your belief will be validated over and over. And we're going to go look at that a little more this morning. Your belief in Jesus will be validated as you become a disciple of Jesus. And so number one is a disciple believes. A second metric or measurement identifier for a disciple is a disciple continues in the word. And this is the second part of John chapter 8, verse 31. A disciple continues in the word. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you see the letters there, NASB, that's New American Standard Version. So if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Why is that so? Jesus is saying, continue in my word. He's literally saying, continue in my teachings. And here's the really good news for you and I, right? We have the teachings of Jesus in written form in the Holy Bible, right? If you go back hundreds and thousands of years ago, they didn't have the kind of text that we have, you know? It was oral tradition. And even further back, you go to the Old Testament, go back to the time of Abraham and Moses, they didn't have the writings the way that we have them. It was just all oral tradition. And it passed down from one generation to another generation to another generation orally. Like for me, I love that we have it in written form um, because I don't always remember everything that's said to me, right? I mean, I just don't. So, But we have the written word of God. And Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciple. And in John chapter 1, um, we see that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the begin, excuse me, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. We saw his glory. So really what Jesus is saying there is not just if you continue in my teachings, it's if you continue in me. John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the word made flesh, right? Jesus is the word made flesh. And so why do we study the Bible? Why do we get into the word? Why do we need to continue in the teachings of Christ? Because when we continue in the word, we're continuing in Jesus, right? When we continue in the word, we continue in Jesus. This happens to be one of my very favorite times of the year. What started this weekend? College football, right? College football started this weekend. Everybody has their teams. Everybody has their alignments. And everybody thinks that their team is better than the other team. And it doesn't matter how good they really are, you just think they're their best and you like to talk all kinds of trash with your friends, right? Uh, that's why I love college football, right? I happen to be a fan of a different team from this area. Some of you know who that is. I'm not going to go there so much because I don't want to cause that this morning, right? <laughs> but <laughs> that's somebody who knows. <laughs> but, but the point is this, right? In order to still be a fan of the teams that I follow, then I still follow those teams, right? I still follow those teams. It's the same way as a disciple of Jesus. If you're growing in your relationship with him, then you have to stay in the word, and we know that the word is made flesh. So a disciple continues in the word. Identification number three is a disciple knows the truth. And this is verse 32. A disciple knows the truth. And this is Jesus talking again. When you continue in my word, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And we're going to talk about being free in just a moment. But you will know the truth. The truth. Isn't that what we all crave, right? We desire in our human relationships, right? We want truth in our relationship with our spouses. <clears throat> we want truth and our relationship with our children. In fact, if our children lie to us, they often get in trouble, do they not? Right, because we crave the truth as people. And I believe the reason that we, are cra uh, that we crave the truth is because we were created to crave the truth. I believe that that is a desire that is placed in us innately from the time of creation, that you have a hunger and a desire to know the truth. We live in an age where <clears throat> truth is maybe not so 
um, adhered to and not so proclaimed, at least universal truth or absolute truth. We hear the term relativism spoken of often, especially the further into secular society that we get. Well, truth is relative. Well, what is it, what is it relative to? to? Relative to your belief? Relative to your experience? Relative to your feelings? What is it relative to? And the problem with the relative truth is it really can't be true, can it? Because the concept of truth itself is that it surpasses all others, right? That's truth. At the brass tacks, bare knuckles, absolutely stripped down, that will always exist. And so if we talk about relativism, and we talk, well, if it, my truth is different than your truth, then how are either one of them true, right? And so we have to make sure that we understand this concept of truth. There is a universal truth. There is an absolute truth. And here's the thing, folks. Neither one of us established what that is. There's not a person in this room that has the authority to establish universal truth. There's not a person in the room that has the authority to establish absolute truth. The only one that has the power and the authority to establish that truth is the Almighty God. That's it. That's it. The Almighty God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we see in John chapter 1, when you look at that, that passage we read a moment ago, that all three were present during that creation. All three together created absolute and universal truth. And so, friends, it is important that we continue in the Word, that we continue in Jesus, because when we continue in Jesus, we know the truth, and a disciple knows the truth. Amen? Number four, a disciple is set free. Why do you need to know the truth? It's the same verse. The reason you need to know the truth is so that you're set free. The reason you need to know the truth is so that you're set free. Just think of a little silly illustration, right? Remember how frustrating it was to be a child, and, and maybe it's too far back to actually remember, but as a parent, watching your child struggle to tie their shoe. <coughs> I went through it four times, trying to teach my kids to tie their shoe. Maybe teaching their kid to ride. Remember the struggle, man? Listen, there's honestly no worse shoe tire in the world than Braylon Patrick Baggett. I, he's just a terrible, terrible shoe tire. And so I'm like, well, maybe I'm a bad teacher. But the other three I taught know how to tie their shoes. I don't know, maybe they're self, self-learners. But Braylon is just bad. And it's still like, Dad, can you tie my shoe? Dad, can you? No, you're eight years old, man. Tie your shoe. Right? Oh, I can't. And so then if he does get them tied, he can't get them untied. So it's kick them off instead of untying them and take them off. Then he comes and brings me the shoe with the knot in it so he can put it back on. Dad, can you untie the knot so I can get my shoe back on? Right? I'm like, Brandon, man, like eight and a half, dude. I had the ball field, got to tie the cleats. I already have my batting gloves on. Take them off, man. Tie your shoe, right? And so, but think about the freedom that comes in, right? Listen, please be free, child. Please be free. Right? Right? When we learn things and when we know things, it creates freedom for us, right? Think about the first time you learned how to drive a car, right? My daughter is 18 today, Kayla, right? And so just last year, year and a half, whatever, I got the, oh, Kayla got her driver's license. There's freedom that comes with having your driver's license, is there not? And all the teenagers are like, woohoo. But there's also responsibility that comes with that, and that's the discipleship process. That's the growing and the learning. It's the responsibility part of being a follower of Jesus. <coughs> Pardon my cough, I'm a little cold. But when you stay in the Word, you know the truth, and the truth sets you free. Free to go where you want to? Not necessarily, because you'll see from Scripture the exact opposite. What you will see is that you are set free from the penalty of your sin. That's what you're set free from. You're set free from the bondage of your sin. For time's sake, we're not going to go there this morning as far as a reference is concerned, but there are numerous passages throughout Scripture that will illustrate very clearly that sin 
is a bondage in your life. <coughs> that until you know the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ, you are in bondage to your sin. You are a prisoner of your sin. You're a slave to your sin. And I know every once in a while they'll open the, the jail downtown and you can go in, tour the old historic jail. And I've never been there, but I've heard people be like, man, I can't even imagine having to stay here. Some of you are in jail and or prison ministry where you go and you see our incarcerated folks that, I mean, they're there. There is no freedom there. Everything is scheduled for them. Everything is planned for them. Everything is dictated for them. There's no freedom there. Scripture says that's what it's like when we're still living in our sin. You are a prisoner or a slave to your sin. But the Bible tells us very clearly that when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that when we continue in his word and that when we know the truth, that we are set free, not only from the bondage of our sin, but from the penalty of our sin. And in Romans, we know that the penalty of our sin is death. The penalty of our sin is eternal death. And so we can rejoice, church, that when we know the truth, that we are free from the bondage of sin, and we are free from the penalty of sin. Number five, a disciple is somebody who strives to live free of sin, or live sin-free. And this is John chapter 8, verses 33 through 36. A disciple is someone who strives to live sin-free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Go ahead, Eric. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free. See, what was happening is these, the people that Jesus is talking to are the Jews. And they didn't totally understand that they had to have this relationship with Jesus. They were still relying on the Abrahamic. We're going to talk about that. Um, a little bit more. But a disciple is somebody who strives to live sin-free. The root word of disciple is the same as the root word for discipline. And so really, a disciple of Jesus is someone who disciplines themselves in living sin-free, right? In this very passage of Scripture, John chapter 8, in the beginning of the passage, is the story of the adulterous woman who is dragged into the temple court. She's caught red-handed in the act of adultery. She's brought into the temple court. The leaders of the sects are there, and they're saying, Jesus, what should we do with her, knowing full well that the penalty of adultery is death? The penalty of adultery is death. And so they put Jesus right on the spot, and Jesus responds to them and says, who here is without sin? None of them can raise their hand, and they all depart. And then he says to the woman, arise, where are your accusers? And she looks around, and then they're nowhere to be found. And then he says this to her, now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. I have freed you from the bondage of your sin. I have freed you from the penalty of your sin. Now you go and sin no more. Right? Proverbs tells us that the one who returns to his sin after being set free from it is like a dog who returns to his vomit. All dog owners have seen this take place, right? Or, or maybe the other end, right? <laughs> all dog owners have seen this take place, and all of us get a little squeamish when it happens, and we scold our dog when he does it, or she does it, correct? Right? But the Bible tells us that we're like that. When we have experienced the freedom of Jesus, free from the bondage of our sin and the penalty of our sin, but then we return to our sin, that we're like a dog that returns to his own vomit. And so a disciple is somebody who strives to live sin-free. But here's the really good news. They also know that God's grace is sufficient. Amen? God's grace is sufficient. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, talks about this. Hey, there's this wicked collision between my flesh and my spirit, and sometimes my flesh wins. Sometimes I do the things that I know that I shouldn't do, and that's chapter 7, and then 8, 1, he says this, 
but thank God, God's grace is sufficient for me. Amen? God's grace is sufficient, but a disciple is somebody who strives to live sin-free. Six identifiers, a disciple makes the word a priority. A disciple is somebody who makes the word a priority. This is John chapter 8, and verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. You seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. And here's the problem with the people that Jesus is talking to. They're relying, as I said a moment ago, on the Abrahamic covenant. <coughs> they think automatically they're in because they're descendants of Abraham. They think that they can just ride daddy's coattails because they're descendants of Abraham, and they can do whatever they want and be okay because they're riding Abraham's coattails. Right? Listen, maybe some of you were raised that way. Maybe your father owned a business and you thought, well, hey, because your dad's the boss, you can do whatever you want and get away with it, right? Or maybe, let's bring it to a spiritual context, maybe you went to church as a kid and so you think you're okay. Maybe you go to church as an adult and you think you're okay because you go to church. But that is not what Jesus is saying here. Listen to his words very clearly. Yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Because my word, my teachings, my son has no place in you. When we do not make the word of God a priority in our lives, in essence, we're killing the word or re-killing Jesus. As believers in Christ, as disciples, knowing that that is the word we use for our growing process, our maturation process, and our relationship with Jesus, when we don't give the word a place of priority in our lives, we're killing the word or killing Jesus. As believers, we ought not to do such. Amen? We have to give the word a priority in our life. Knowing that the term disciple means to be disciplined in the teachings of Jesus, or it's the growing process Knowing that Jesus is the Word made flesh, how in the world are we going to grow in our relationship with Him if we're not spending time in the Word? Corbin and I talk all the time, hey man, as much as we would love to think that it happens in a one-hour meeting on a Sunday morning because we're just that effective as preachers, <coughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. You have to give the Word a place of priority in your life during the week. Things like you version on our Facebook page. Use that weekly reading plan. Grow with the church because we're better together. Number seven, a disciple does the works of the Father. A disciple does the works of the Father. This is John 8, 38 through 41. For times, oh, there we go. I speak the things which I've seen with my Father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your Father. They answered and said to him, Abraham's in our Father. If you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father, they said to him. We're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. The bottom line is this, church. Does your life reflect God? Do you do the works of the Father? Do you do the works of Jesus Christ? When people see your life, do they see Jesus? A disciple does the works of the Father. A disciple loves God. It's number eight. A disciple loves God. It's a pretty simple. Do you love God? I mean, really, really love him. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come of my own initiative, but he who sent me. Do you love God? Does your life show that you love God? <clears throat> Number nine, a disciple listens to understand. This is John 8.43. There's a big difference between hearing and listening, right? Jesus said, why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. If you not understand what I'm saying, it's because you cannot hear my word. Every parent, every spouse knows there's a big difference between hearing and listening, right? Listening usually involves action, right? If I'm listening, that means there's an action involved. And we hear in the Bible that, hey, it's not the hearers of the word that is, are blessed. <coughs> it is the doers. And it's because the doers are listeners. A disciple listens to understand. And then finally, 
A disciple observes his truth. John chapter 8 and 51. A disciple observes his truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And so, ushers, let me go ahead and have you guys come on up. I'm going to go through these ten steps again very quickly. A disciple believes. A disciple continues in the word. A disciple knows the truth. A disciple is set free. A disciple strives to live sin free. A disciple makes the word a priority, does the works of the Father, loves God, listens to understand, and observes his truth. Observes his truth. Do we have an usher on this side? Can I grab one? Just one of the guys? Thank you, DJ. You guys can go ahead. What, what these guys are passing out to you this morning <coughs> is our life group launch. And so we told you that <coughs> we believe that discipleship is better together. At Life Change Church, we believe that one of the best places for discipleship to happen is in a life group. And so we're very excited about this coming semester as far as life groups are concerned. They're going to be starting in the next week. And so in your hand is a list of every life group that we have. Let me go ahead and have that life group slide, please. We'll put it up there as well. So there you can see them. Financial Peace is being taught by Fran Cantwell. Uh, there's a book study out of the Salt Shaker being led by Missy Bonham. Train for Something Greater is being led by Travis. How to Study the Bible are be, is being led by myself and my wife. Um, there's a devotional-based Bible study taking place at the Huffman's house. Blend Book Study is You and Me Forever. It's Chris and Sonia Linder. That's a marriage-based life group. Change of Lifers is Marsha Wolford. And then Book Study Breathe by Megan Klein. And then, again, the reading plan on the Facebook page. And next semester, we're looking to do a live stream discipleship-based uh, life group. And so what I want to encourage you this morning, church, is those 10 identifiers that we talked about, those are the identifiers of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Those are the disciples. That's the identifiers of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, here are your action steps. Here's your action steps. They're twofold. Number one, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a relationship with him, then your first action could be to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning. To ask him to come into your heart, to forgive you of the penalty of your sin, to forgive you of the bondage of your sin, and to put you on the course of freedom. And then the second is this, join a life group. And so in the chair back in front of you, you're going to find a response card. On that response card, you're going to see an action step. And that action step, I would encourage you, take a moment, pray about it, Commit to joining a life group this morning. Commit to joining a life group this morning. And in a moment, the ushers are going to come back up. I'll be back up to provide the next steps. Go ahead and take a moment and pray. Thank you for listening to the Life Change Church podcast. If you were here today and you were listening and you made a decision to follow Christ, we would love to hear about it. Or maybe you're here and you're listening and that God is asking you, to make the next step with whatever that it is in your life. We would love to hear about it and partner up with you. If you would, go to www.mylifechangechurch.com and under the media section, please fill out the contact us information and let us know if you made a decision to follow Christ. Let us know what God is asking of you. And if you need prayer, we would love to partner up with you in prayer as well. We hope that you enjoyed the podcast and that it both encouraged and challenged you. Have a great week.